in that case, um, uh, welcome to uh, our spec second speaker meeting of, of the uh, season. Um, I'm delighted uh, to welcome uh, uh, Anne, who's uh, going to speak to us tonight. Uh, before I um, introduce her properly, uh, let me just uh, bring you up to date with uh, what's been going on. Uh, with the C Civic Society, those of you who are not on the uh, exec committee. Uh, well, we've only had one, obviously, one committee meeting since then, and that's been, uh, the time has mainly been taken up with the Constitution. Um, it's been altered again. I'm not sure whether we're on Plan Z by now, but um, the final wording will be uh, out to you uh, very shortly for your um, approval. Uh, but we will then have a specific meeting uh, to accept that uh, constitution officially. The, um, I'd, um, I'm assuming you're all aware as members of the C Civic Society that the, the society has two committees attached to it. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the planning scrutiny group, uh, which uh, Hugh uh, is the uh, spokesperson for, uh, and Anne alongside, well, on my screen alongside Hugh, um, is also a member of that. Now that is not a closed group, it is open to anyone uh, sp particularly if they have any specific knowledge about historic buildings, um, building work or planning um, and would like to get involved, then please uh, contact um, myself or David uh, or James and uh, we'll put you in touch with the other members of that committee. Now the other group is called Lancaster Vision. And Lancaster Vision does the proactive work, if you like, for the uh, society. The civic society tends to react to what's going on. The point of the vision is that it goes out and tries to change things or get involved in change. And in this past month, uh, we've had a meeting with the City Council uh, regarding social housing and in January we'll be running a uh, consultation seminar on the um, plans that the City Council have for the provision of more social housing. Um, we've also been uh, had a meeting with the County Council regarding Lancaster's traffic issues and uh, I don't know if you've all seen the uh, leaflet that the county issued a, few, a week or so ago about their plans for Junction 33 uh, and talking about their thoughts for the city centre. Well we have another meeting lined up with the engineers to take that further. So we'll keep you posted on anything that we achieve. Again, Lancaster Division is open to anyone who, uh, on, on, as a member of the Civic Society, who wants to come along, see what's going on, get involved, okay. you're more than welcome. Again, come back to me or David or James, and we can let you know the details for the next meeting. So that's the, what we've been up to. So the main business of the evening, um, what we're all here for, not to listen to me, uh, but to uh, listen to uh, Anne Oliver. Uh, Anne is the Community Engagement Manager for Age UK Lancashire. Now, she sent me, well, she sent David, um, the bio of her, and at the end of it, it talks about gun running and dealing in bodies, 
which sounds a bit more interesting than um, concerns of elderly. So we may be bringing her back to talk about her gun running activities. Um, you can deny <laughs> all you like, Han, it's here <laughs> in print. Um, <laughs> it's meant yes. to be a joke, I think. But, um, it, well, it's absolutely true. My father used to introduce, my, when I was in different jobs in a, pre, in a previous life, he'd say, hello, this, hi, I haven't seen you for a while. This is my daughter, Anne, she's a gun runner. And when I worked for a property company, he used to say, this is my daughter, Anne, she's a Rachmanite property developer. And most of you are probably old enough to know who I'm talking about. Yeah, quite. And, um, and then when I was an international, I was an international recruitment consultant for a lot of years, and he used to say, oh, she deals in bodies. So it's a bit more interesting at parties than saying, I'm a recruitment consultant. It's like saying you're an estate agent, people glaze over. Um, so yeah, but I, I, I could do a whole, a whole evening on uh, when, when we lost our, our security guards up the Angolan jungle and discovered we had no insurance for them. That's a good story. Hmm. Um, but for another uh, day. Someone will be taking notes of all this and uh, oh, yes. recording it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. She has, uh, Anne spent, uh, before COVID, spent her time uh, traveling around speaking to groups within the Lancashire area. Uh, she went as far as Merseyside, well, Southport anyway. Um, and um, I understand she's been interviewed on a regular basis by Radio Lancashire, although that may have been about the gun running. Um, <laughs> so. Her subject tonight, uh, if I can find it on these two different pages that I've got here, is responding to challenges facing older people during these times. So, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank You're welcome. you very much indeed. Thank, thank you, John. And yes, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about civic buildings. I'm talking about um, civic people, I suppose, aren't I tonight? I do have a PowerPoint presentation and if the world of uh, the virtual world works, I'll try and run through it. Uh, just because some of it does include facts and figures and uh, a bit more easy to retain. Um, I just want to call out though, because we, because you are specific society and you are um, deal a lot in round housing. Just before I came on air, I had a, 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 an appeal from a lady who lives on Regent's Park, Caravan Park with her husband who has dementia. And they've been told that they have to get off the site uh, because of lockdown. Now, I, 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 I don't know whether that's because it's not a permanent site, Regent's Park, but that, exceed, that worries me hugely um, and uh, because they're being rendered homeless and he has dementia and they've nowhere to go. So if anybody in the audience tonight has anything to do with housing homes or can give me any advice um, that would be more than helpful and I can talk to you at the end but that's uh, one of the very very real issues facing us at the moment and I'll be trying to sort that out tomorrow um, but uh, so if anybody can help please do right I'm going to try and screen share a bit now I'm just going to st start the side slideshow Can you see that? Perfect. Can. Good. Always a good start. Yeah, so um, uh, we came up with the title, David and I, responding to the challenges facing older people during these times. And I've added BC, DC and AC. Before COVID, during COVID and after COVID. I thought about PC, but that means other things. So we'll stick with after COVID. Um, so um, just as a way of of talking about the different times. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about really the world that we were in, um, you know, and, and so the challenges facing older people, bef be, you know, before we ever were in the, the world of COVID. And out of the 1.2 million residents of Lancashire 12, so by Lancashire 12, I'm excluding Blackpool and uh, Blackburn, there were, you know, 1.2 million people and virtually a quarter of a million of those were over 65. And if you included Blackpool, there was over a half a million over 50s across the county. 
that's one awful lot of people in that age category. Um, and of those, 35,000 already um, admitted to being lonely and isolated and, and in, a, in a lot of cases, chronically lonely. So the loneliness and isolation of COVID is not new. A lot of these people, it's actually, it was a existence beforehand and it continues, um, it, it continues very much as, as before, but with added layers of, of issues. Um, of other issues facing older people, the over 60s, there were over 43,000 people um, counted as being income deprived. So that's essentially living on state pension and pension credit. Um, so again, very significant numbers. And we all know there's pockets of, um, of, of deprivation in Morecambe, in Lancaster and across the county. We have some of the highest levels of deprivation in the country, including, you know, in Burnley. And over uh, 12,000, almost 13,000 people across Lancashire and Blackpool uh, living with dementia. And I would say that that's an awful lot higher than that figure because that's just people that have been diagnosed and officially counted. And um, another topic that I'm going to be coming on to as well, um, digital exclusion. 28% of those over 60 um, across the country are not online. An awful lot of those are over the age of 85, but interestingly, those that are online, particularly the older ones, say what a huge, massive impact it's had on their lives and how glad they are they did it, once they did it, but 28% is still a huge, huge, you know, it's virtually, the, you know, a third of the population that age that aren't online. So another of the challenges that we're trying to work with and being really come to the fore in lockdown. So... I'm just going to go back to loneliness for a minute uh, and if anybody has any questions if you go as you go along uh, if you want to put them in the in the chat box or let or, or interrupt stick your hand up whatever um but um Santander in June did a survey they worked with Age UK nationally and they provided a lot of their staff uh, as befrienders telephone befrienders across the country and they did um a piece of work talking to people about loneliness and 25% of adults so that's adults of all ages said that they made them realize that they had no real friends and I think that's a really tragic um, statistic um, 12 percent broke rules as they were so desperate to see family and friends that's during first lockdown 75% of the over 55 said they'd really struggled during lockdown um, 40 percent said they were eating too much 25 percent said they were drinking too much and we don't mean tea and coffee i was one of them but i'm not anymore um 38 percent saw deterioration in older and vulnerable people's um mental health you know family members going downhill and i'll come back to that in a minute as well and um in the over 50 over 55s were the most likely group to have gone 31 days to speak to without speaking to anybody now there's over about a million people before lockdown used to say that they didn't speak to anybody virtually about you know an odd person it, it, you know it, over a month apart from going to the sort of shops um so um you know they were already huge statistics but out of the people um, that they spoke to, 55% hadn't told anybody else about the concerns. So that people were, 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 were admitted it during the survey, but hadn't actually talked to anybody prior to that. So these are some pretty, I think, stark statistics. And I'm not a numbers person, but I think, it, I think they, these are very worrying stats. And when you, fall, you, you throw in the other challenges that are facing older people at any time, you know, frailty and falls. There's over 4,000 admissions a year for just from falls in the university hospitals of, you know, the county, never mind the others. Um, unnecessary hospital admissions just caused by self-neglect, not eating properly, people not taking the pills when they're supposed to, getting confused. Um, all those issues, unnecessary trips to the doctor, just basically because people are lonely and isolated and actually going to the doctors is something to do. Well, a lot of those people, of course, haven't been able to do that during lockdown, which has even added to another layer of isolation. Lack of, lack of care. 
people struggling to get the right care, to get care assessments, to get to be able to afford care. Um, and again, that's obviously been really exacerbated by, um, by COVID. And care homes, again, people's issues around, you know, finding care homes, getting a care home place, affording care, paying privately for care, um, getting care assessments, moving care. And during COVID, of course, you know, the, the, the issues caused by people not being able to visit loved ones, the deterioration in people's health, mental health, both people in the homes, because they, can't, they haven't been visited and also with the family members. One of my girlfriend's mum's in um, home locally. She's at end of life and she was allowed to see her mother through her bedroom window yesterday. Um, and so Age UK nationally are working very closely with the government around um, the deprivation of sort of liberties and the, is the issues facing care because this, some people I know have not seen their parent face to face since March. Uh, I've seen my mother through, a, through a, a window across a dining room table to keep the distance um, on a couple of occasions. So working really, really uh, close on that. People who desperately need in care home places for family members, people with dementia who they really can't handle at home anymore, but how do you visit a care home? How do you choose a care home place? Can you get somebody into a care home? Would you trust a care home now? All these issues that we're trying to work with. Locally as Age UK, we don't go into care homes, Age UK Lancashire. Um, it's not part of our remit. Our remit is to keep people independent at home for as long as possible. And, um, and but as a national organisation to which Age UK Lancashire is affiliated, Age UK National do the campaigning and working very hard with government and working with what's called John's Law, which was um, law broken it, brought in to um, allow people to be present in hospitals with family members with dementia. And again, they are pushing to keep that rule enforceable at the moment because the last place you want a person with dementia is in a hospital at the moment. Um, other challenges faced were lack of later life planning, always an issue. Part of my role traveling the, 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 the county has been talking to people about, you know, have you got a will in place? If not, why not? Have you got a power of attorney? Do you know what a power of attorney is? Um, and of course, some of these issues, people have, oh, I don't need a will because I ain't going to die. Well, suddenly COVID's come along and an awful lot of people have realised that actually, um, you know, mortality is very real. Um, and we've heard the horror stories of people trying to will, write yeah. wills from hospital beds. Um, so... Um, that is something that we've been working uh, closely with our solicitors across the county who do um, will writing sessions for us. They um, provide basic will writing at sort of half price, but then they gift that money, the fees to Age UK National, I mean, to, sorry, to Age UK Lancashire. So essentially they do it pro bono for us and they've been working very hard and, and using lots of, uh, of initiative to, to help people write wills and get them signed uh, legally. Um, carers, carers are al always under an awful lot of pressure, free care, the billions of pounds that is saved by the economy every year by family carers. Um, I've had the most desperate phone calls over the past months from carers who are climbing the wall trying to look after people with dementia, trying to keep them in the house when they weren't allowed to go out during lockdown. Um, people, um, the capacity of loved ones absolutely nose diving during lockdown because they weren't going out, they weren't being stimulated, they weren't getting to daytime supports, they weren't going to singing groups, they weren't going to dementia cafes. And of course the carers hadn't had that support as well of going along and having some respite and chatting to people in the same boat. So all those issues were already there prior to COVID um, and they have just, you know. Change, is it? Pardon, sorry? I can't hear. Someone ask a question. Maybe just a couple. 
Um, so this is just this is just a, a, a bit of a picture that um, a bit of a collage from the early days actually of lockdown, um, showing some of our home help staff, our hospital aftercare staff, um, visiting, taking people home from hospital. Some have taken their masks off for the photo purposes, um, and uh, uh, they, the, the staff. I have to say, within our organisation, they responded so flexibly and so rapidly, um, you know, to the challenges. Uh, all credit to them. It was um, so proud. Um, I just want to cover a little bit about the services that we had to try and address some of those issues before Corona, before COVID, and, uh, and then during. And then talk a little bit about some of the new services we've got now. Um, advice and information is always one of our core services. That includes giving people information, um, benefits checks, on um, completing oh attendance allowance forms, blue badge forms, advice around housing, um, and any other help that they needed. Well, as soon as Corona, as soon as lockdown, we moved all those services online and we managed to continue to do attendance forms um, over the telephone. So people got the form sent out and then we would talk them through it. Not me, people who know what they're doing. Um, and that has continued to now. Now we, we just started doing face to face again. And of course, now we're back on the phones. Our hospital aftercare service, which also includes a take home and settle service, that's um, for anybody coming home from hospital or from a stay in a care home, a, a sort of as respite or um, reablement care. We take them home from hospital and we can work with people for up to six weeks to provide them with all the practical support that they need. So we'll drive them home from hospital, we'll make sure there's food in the house, that there's, it's clean, it's tidy, it's warm. Uh, they've got the prescriptions and that if they've got some personal carers coming in that those carers are coming in and the idea being to make sure that during the six week period that they do not get readmitted into hospital unless it's really necessary and I know in the Lancaster area last year we had 52 different referral streams used which is actually one an awful lot I really can't think of 52 different places that we would refer people to but that includes people um, getting uh, smoke alarms fitted uh, um, the panic alarms your falls alarms uh, referrals for clothes for housing help benefits checks we had one gentleman we took home from hospital only to discover the only clothes he had was what he came home from hospital in his bed was black with mold we had to get him cooker, bed, bedding. Our charity shops rallied round. We got, um, you know, grants from different grant making organisations, and that's a very, you know, that is not untypical of some of the work we pick we, we pick up just through taking somebody home from hospital. And that's why people are often readmitted into hospital because if the living conditions are so poor, then um, the health is going to suffer. The daytime support services, the most, uh, the closest to Lancaster was at Garstang. Um, we had nine different centres across the county. Those were closed, um, you know, virtually immediately on lockdown with fairly dramatic effects for quite a lot of people, the carers and the people they cared for because they were climbing the wall. They were used to going out, they were used to going to daytime support and it was really really tragic for a lot of people we reopened a uh, bit by bit in october in little bubbles in groups um, our manager is now called two meter peter because he don't spend all his time going around with a two meter stick um, and we have reopened our daytime support actually at ll village hall we've moved from garstang to ll which is a lovely location it's great completely accessible and i'm told the food is wonderful um peter doesn't like going now to his uh his uh, weight watchers on a saturday because of the food so um, if anybody knows people who would benefit from daytime support um, we now do have one locally and we do have some availability in small small bubbles with the moment with two days a week the home help service is a paid for service 
and we've been running that for since about 2011. That's continued all the way through through COVID, and we added a layer of free um, free essential home help for people who were shielded, and that was funded by Lancashire County Council until until August. So that was for the immediate lockdown period. Um, dementia support. We only we've not had funding for dementia work um, in Lancaster District for about five years, somewhat tragically. Um, but we have had funding in West Langs and Chorley. So we moved our support onto the telephone, which allowed us then to talk to people who were in desperate need of support anywhere in the county. And we also set up a Zoom dementia hub to replace the, the dementia hub that we had in the Bay Area, the File Coast, West Langs. And uh, that's been going now uh, for many months on a fortnightly basis. Integrated care, that is work to prevent hospital admissions, and that is actually a needs to the county only, but we work with the GP surgeries to help people with everything non-medical to try and keep them out of hospital. Our employment support service, which is with it for the over 50s, um, that has, has continued, but as telephone only. Um, our charity shops closed, they reopened, and then they closed again. They reopened really successfully, but sadly, um, we've had to close. And uh, for myself on community engagement, well, you know, I've moved on to a virtual world, and I'll talk about a bit that later. And the new services, we've had to be really, really responsive and really quickly. And I think that the, the charitable sector has really come into its own in this area um, du during the crisis very, very quickly. Um, you know, the, the charities came together. In our own case, um, our management responded very quickly. We retrained staff. We set up the new Good Day Calls and Support at Home services. We retrained staff. We moved things online. We had meetings after meetings after meetings over Teams, and, and we now do full day workshops on over Teams and, um, and Zoom. Our staff, as I've said before, they, they were just unbelievable and people who should have been shielding in some cases who were over 70 who worked for us refused to stop working on the hospital aftercare service and they weren't going to sit at home. Um, we, we received um, some funding to set up a good day call service. Now David's heard me bang on about good day calls for quite a while now. We've been trying to set it up and fund it but it's proved very difficult. And the idea is to provide daily welfare calls to people who are living on their own and really struggling, um, um, who really benefit from just having a, a person ring them every day, because it's one thing having a panic alarm if you fall over, that's not a person talking to you and checking you up and about. So with funding from Lancashire County Council um, to keep in contact with the shielded people, we set that, set that service up and we now have funding. We've had additional funding till March. Unfortunately, it's going to be very, very tough to make into a sustainable service. And part of the reason for that is that the good day calls to check the people up and about are turning into like 20 minute calls because it's the only person that people speak to in a day often. So they're not letting them go in a hurry. So it's making it very, very difficult to fund it, to, to, to have a... Um, a model of working that is affordable for people to sort of pay for going forward. So if anybody's got ideas for funding, see me, um, because I've got a, a, a huge waiting list now for that service and we're trying to cover people as much as we can um, with support elsewhere. The support at home service, as I say again, was funded by Lancashire County Council for the, pre, for the, you know, the first lockdown period. Um, and uh, that hasn't continued um, into this period. Art of Isolation and Veterans Art of Isolation, two projects we set up um, to really keep people going. Um, during lockdown, give people creative ideas. We set up a web page, uh, Jodie Prenger of Blackpool singing fame, um, Oliver, Nancy, um, came on board with us and um, we set up websites um, with ideas of things to do. We then received some funding from Age UK National and um, Comic Relief to actually collate works by people from across the county. And we're setting up, we're launching on Monday, a virtual exhibition on our website. 
and we tomorrow I'm expecting 200 books to land in my back kitchen along with 200 envelopes, 200 compliment slips and everything else to go out to the people who submitted for the, the um, project which has been published into a beautiful 128 page book of poetry, musings, um, artwork, craft work, ph uh, photography, showing all the different aspects of isolation, you know, during it. So we've had growing people growing things for the first time, drawing for the first time in their lives. We've had people's rantings about how they're trying to cope with their mother over the telephone. Um, we've had wonderful pictures of uh, of N uh, NHS, you know, paintings of NHS stuff in full PPE. We've had Black Lives Matter embroideries. It's really followed the course of the news as well. So we've had loneliness and isolation. We've had nature, we've had gardening pictures, um, and we've had photographs through windows. Um, so um, that we've got the official launch of that on Sunday. Um, and uh, for the vast sum of 9.99, you can all order a copy. See me later. Um, we 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 just launched at the end of 2019 retirement planning courses, and um, they encompassed all aspects of pensions, drawdown, financial modelling, case studies, um, inheritance taxes, care fee planning, wills, powers of attorney. Um, health issues, mental health, physical health, how to use your 24 hours in retirement. And I'm sure some of you uh, know what that's all about and actually the, how challenging it can be from going to working life to 24 hours. And so looking at how to manage that. And then digital inclusion, we received um, a donation of 50 tablets from a software company in April for distribution to people who were living at home and who desperately needed to contact their families. And they were locked down, so you could only really use them for social media use. So for FaceTiming, for um, Zoom. And so that people could talk to the families and could actually go on to support groups, but they couldn't go on Mr. Google, um, but you can do your food ordering as well. So it was set up to be really practical for people that needed them. Um, which is absolutely fine distributing them, but then how do you train these people? How do you support them? Um, and we have received some funding. So as of Monday, I have a digital inclusion coordinator, Yippee, who will be helping to support these people, but also offering support to anybody across the county who has equipment, but doesn't really know how to use it. We'll be helping them to get online and we'll be helping us to find equipment. We'd had a promise of up to 100 additional pieces of kit. I had a waiting list of 30 and zero arrived. There is a national shortage of IT equipment. And so I've had some quite difficult conversations. So if anybody has access to secondhand kit, um, please, please let me know because we're getting, we've got, we, we've never, never needed to get older people online more than at the moment, whether it's for shopping, whether it's for talking to friends and for entertainment, doing their banking, you know, post, you know, all these things. So if anybody has access to any kit, please, please let me know. In amongst it all, we learned, we, we launched a new veteran service just down the file coast. The reason it's down the file coast is that's where there's the highest instance of um, veterans in the country, evidently, and certainly in Lancashire. So um, we um, are working with individuals there to make sure that they have access to all the support they need. And one of those gentlemen is 97. He was a Marine and he had never had any access to any um, veterans support services in his, in his, in his life until, uh, until we sort of found him as it were. Um, and I think I've got a photo, might have a photo of him later. Um, these are just a few stats, uh, and I'm not going to bang on about it, but it just gives a bit of an idea of what we've done. Over, over 9,000 phone calls for help with, with, with benefits, with attendance allowances and other advice. Um, about se over 1,700 calls to people with dementia to help support them. There's only about three people on that team, so that's a lot of phone calls. Um, 
uh, about over 8,000, nearly 9,000 good day calls, um, uh, over 10,000 um, visits to people with this shopping, cleaning and other support, um, you know, 3,300 hospital aftercare, um, uh, that's people, not visits, that's over 3,000 people that we've helped come out of hospital um, and settle back at home and looked after for up to six weeks since uh, since March, and um, and and over five, just about six thousand um, um, contacts with people. That's just in the east of the county to help manage the long term condition. <laughs> um, we're not a big organisation. We're not got a huge staff, and so that's um, some pretty significant figures there. And in fact, we've had more phone calls to our phone line in the first so for four months of the year than we would have in a whole year normally. This is some of the stuff that I used to do um, in the real world. So I set up a, a, a community hub, which was very successful at Boltonley Sands. And uh, we'd been running for about, about 18 months, I think. Uh, nearly, no, nearly two years before we had to shut down. Um, picture, uh, that's a round table. It's called a Tokioki. That was in... Nelson Town Centre just after the Manchester bombings and it was a community you know um, community getting together to talk about the issues anybody could just turn up sit down in a chair and say the bit um, I was at the launch of the dementia friendly train line the northern line on the most freezing cold disgusting day ever on a freezing cold northern line train to Leeds first thing in the morning. We came back on a super duper branded dementia friendly train coming back. It was all singing, all dancing, but by God, the train that took us to Leeds took us back to the 1960s. Um, and, uh, but that was, um, you know, another, th another piece of our work around um, uh, dementia friendly communities and training people. Um, with three ladies there receiving a check from the file Sir Optimist, they funded our befriending service on the file coast for three years, which is absolutely wonderful. Bottom one is at the Rainbow Centre for an Older People's Forum sponsored event. Um, I think David was probably involved with that one. I, I, I recognise the photo. <laughs> David Morris turned up, didn't he? he we, did. made him, we made him do the conga. Yeah, he danced. Yeah, he did. He danced. Um, no more said on that. Um, uh, Christmas tree festival we always support at Wharton just as a bit of a fundraiser and awareness raising and then a Christmas party that was organised over in Longridge with some support. So we've moved to the virtual world now and um, so these I've mentioned all of these things already. Um, um, this, this, is, this is Angela and Teresa um, Angela, who contacted me with regards to her to her mother, as I did I mention her that had been wandering and wouldn't stay home at the beginning of lockdown. I'll just read a quote. She's got paintings in the in the exhibition, and if I can pull it up on my other bit here, I'll just read a quote from her. Um, I kept telling everyone, even my family, that I was fine, but I wasn't, and my daughters knew it, and they were mad at me because I wouldn't do what they said I should do, go and see the doctor, get some help. You see, I was the helper always, not the help. Um, anyway, my daughter told me exactly what she thought in one of our telephone conversations, and she phoned me back the next morning and said she'd been in touch with Age UK Lancashire about getting a tablet so we could Zoom, and they could do some shopping for me and give me a phone call once a week for a quick chat, just check I was okay and to have someone I could tell if I wasn't feeling right anyway she goes on a bit about it she said um, 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 I heard I was going to be a great grandmother over zoom we share knitting and art and baking we are reading my son-in-law's newest book together I could I could see the video of hedgehogs that moved in my daughter's garden I can see when she is struggling too and she can see how I am and she knows when I'm not fine I still get angry about the situation we are in now, but I'm coping. Zooming isn't the same as a big, big hug right now, but I'll take it with big thanks to Age UK Lancashire. I'm even thinking of getting my own tablet now. It's easier than I thought it would be. So she's just, and she's got one of her paintings in the art exhibition, and that is part of the work, the reading, and um, the work that, um, the piece of writing that goes with it. Each painting or piece of work in the book has the backstory with it because it's a storytelling that came to 
the piece of work being created that's important. Um, so that's just the retirement planning and that is our first Zoom dementia hub and um, some of the people there. So this is some of the pictures of Art of Isolation. This is one of Teresa's, the lady there, her bird. When the first uh, mock-up of the book came out, I looked at it and I thought, no, that bird's upside down. It, they had it coming out of the water like a phoenix rising. And I thought, I'm sure that bird's supposed to be coming out the clouds, not out of the water. So I had to contact her daughter very quickly. She said, no, it's coming downhill out, <laughs> out of the sky. I thought, if the book's published and Teresa's bird's going the wrong way, I'll never live it down. Uh, we've got some lockdown haircuts there from Ben, who is actually the community engagement manager over at Preston Council. He submitted, and this is a portrait of, of a young man who um, his father drew it from a photo. He's on an ashram in India. He went out there last year. He'd had a really tough time in life, got locked down in India on the ashram. They were locked in the room. They were sharing rooms and they weren't allowed to leave the room for weeks. People brought food to the door. So um, they've had a pretty tough time. Nobody could fly home. Um, and now I think the Indian um, authorities are trying to get them out, but um, nobody's got a visa anymore. Nobody's got a flight home because they've all been uh, whatever, they've all expired. Um, so that's so, so some of the stories that, that, that came through from that. And I would say to people, you know, please have a look on our website beginning of next week to see the exhibition. Um, I just wanted to run through, I think, some of the, the learning and positives from um, the, the, the COVID period as organisations. And I think I'm talking now, particularly in the Lancaster district, that's where you are, that's what interests you. And I've and I just live in water and I'm, you know, Lancastrian um, moved into. Um, and, and what I found is how strengthened the community has been in Lancaster through COVID. We've always been great at networking. The, the, um, the charitable sector, we've had a great network, network going. Um, I'm a bit of a networking queen. Um, everybody, everybody knows Anne Oliver. Um, I always say I'm like Marmite, like me or hate me, you'll remember me. Um, and um, so, you know, I've got sort of uh, uh, always been part of a lot of groups. Um, but the mutual aid groups, as they're called, that, 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 that were set up in all the villages have really strengthened the communities. We've been able to work with those. We were all struggling to get volunteers prior to COVID. Nobody could get volunteers. Everybody was looking after grandchildren. People were still working. The, the pot of volunteers you would normally dip into were, were sort of disappearing as, as people wanted other things out of retirement and were going traveling and going to the gym and, and being roped into grandchildren. And there wasn't the same pot. That has brought people, I think, back to volunteering um, in the communities, and I think it will strengthen the sector. It's really raised the importance of the charitable sector. I think the responsiveness, the speed that the, the charitable sector and certainly our, our staff adapted to the, to the needs was very rapid, and it left an awful lot of, um, or, uh, uh, of people behind. Uh, it has strengthened, though, the networks between the charitable sector, businesses and local authorities. Um, and I think that will be very, very positive for the future, will help a lot of the, the, the visions for, for Lancaster District going forward, the digital inclusiveness um, and all the, the, those different aspirations, housing, homelessness, um, it, all have been brought to the fore. We also received support from businesses that we would never, ever, ever have received in the pre-COVID days. We had an offer of a computer server from a company. Now, if we'd wanted, I'd gone cap in hand for a, a server prior to COVID, we'd have got nowhere. They offered us one. And by gum, did we take it with open arms because we were absolutely desperate for additional um, you know, computer power. So we've had lots and lots of, of great support, a lot of networking with the SMEs and business groups. We've had pallets of toilet rolls. We've had, they, we were kept going with PPE at different stages as well by companies. So we're eternally grateful. Links between GP surgery with GP surgeries has really been enhanced. Prior to COVID, it was really, really difficult to get to GPs, to get them to listen to you now. 
now that you know they're coming to us the community connectors or the social prescribers um based there or at the city council um and 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 we've all had to look at new ways of working virtual home working i've never been in more meetings in my life i could you know back to back zooms all day um the savings in travel and time going from one part of the county to another I'm saving a thousand miles a month just in uh, in driving and um, that's huge cost savings to us as an organization we'll never go back to those ways of working um, I think um, we've looked you know hugely at supportive working at mental health issues I think community wise in all age groups are really aware of the of those issues now within the organizations We've, we've set up our support groups into organisational on a Friday afternoon. We have an hour where people can come together and just have a, a bit of a sound off um, within our own organisations. You know, we've all got mental health first aiders and are looking really closely at, you know, at people's resilience. It's been a long, long year so far and we've got a very long winter to get through. So it's really important that, you know, everybody looks after their health and, and each other. Um, lots, lots of organisational coming together, lots of Zoom, lots of Teams meetings. Um, and as I say, you know, we've seen increased public, you know, business sector support for communities and charities. And, you know, we hope that that will continue going forward. Um, the need for, um, you know, the digital inclusion, as we've already mentioned, a lot of increased awareness of the importance of that. More people coming forward to offer support, funding, and hopefully equipment when it when it's available. And I am working um, early days talks with Lancaster City Council about their digital inclusion project. This is just one or two photos just to show you what's been going on. This is this is LL, I think, Village Hall, um, where they're getting getting themselves um, set up so they can go in safely and how people are sitting far apart. But people are loving it. They're really enjoying it, you know, and um, they're still doing the bingo and the exercises. And this is a 97 year old veteran that had never had any support before. Uh, and before we found him just recently. So I just thought that was a, a wonderful little face there. And um, if anybody's interested, um, I've just had this through today. A couple of young ladies have set up um, a, 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 a Christmas virtual market um, in Lancaster on the well, it's for Lancashire but they're based in Lancaster on the 14th and 15th of November so that's this week coming weekend isn't it and I think they're looking for any companies who want to get involved to sell their stuff um, over um, uh, virtually and I'll send out more details if anybody's interested and that's it really um, and I'm sorry if I've I'm just going to stop that sharing now. I'm very sorry if I've I've talked far too long and at you. <laughs> I, I don't think uh, that's uh, an issue at all, Anne. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's a lot of um, thought-provoking uh, information there. Um, we, with your permission, we will put that presentation up on our website um and draw attention to it on social media yes please please mm -hmm. and i think you know one of the shout outs really and i think i've missed the slide maybe i switched off too quickly was actually to, to you know, really as well to ask you know as well for any help that as as members that people can give whether if people are parts of businesses if people like to get involved in fundraising we have a breakout um fundraiser which sadly had to be, be postponed where we lock people up for the day and uh, people friends family business colleagues have to pay they have to fundraise so much money during the day before they're let out and sadly because of the new lockdown we weren't allowed to do it so we will be coming back to that um, and they're locked up in a secret location so if anybody thinks that they know enough people who would pay to get them let out I probably know more that would pay to keep me stuck in than pay to get me out. Well, um, I think that would be my problem. Yeah. yeah, that would be my. I did suggest that we had another one. I did suggest that we lock people in their bathrooms and they only live in a house. And so the family um, had to raise money so they could get access to their loos during lockdown. 
um, but that one didn't come to fruition, maybe because too many people have more than one loo in their houses now. So any help with fundraising and just eyes and ears, really. Um, so Roger's just come up on my screen. Hi, Roger. Um, Hi, um. Um, uh, you know, really to be our eyes and ears. I mean, and Roger will have seen an awful lot of what I've been talking about. Um, you know, please do refer to us. You know, please do point us in the direction if, you, if you're aware of any funding of any individuals who are in any form of crisis, of carers, people who could benefit from any of those services. Everything is on our website. Just age, if you just Google Age UK Lancashire, everything comes up. Um, and, you know, really just any way that people can support us at all. We've, we're eternally grateful. We always need equipment for daytime supports. We need hard cash. This year, we will be fine this year, um, purely because we have received some funding. We've received funding to run the Good Day Calls, to run the um, support at home services. That money's dried up now. It won't come again. Um, the people's giving has been humongous this year. People are now worried about their own finances. They're worried about their own jobs. And, and, and I think people have got giving fatigue. We're very, very worried about what's going to happen to services next year. And I think the one thing that we have all realised is how dependent, you know, we, we are as a society on the charitable sector. And we're still missing people. I really need help to reach, to reach those hard to reach people. One of the reasons I go on the radio is because, you know, so much of our work now is virtual. The people haven't got a computer or the family members haven't got a computer and out watching what's going on. How do people hear about the services? So that's why I sort of cultivate Radio Lancashire quite a lot to, to because do people do do listen to the radio? Um, so anything, anything that people can do, because we really need to, I think, invest in our communities going forward. Um, and yeah, I know you're you're a heritage society, you're a civic society, and you know, and it's about the pe it's about as people as much as the buildings, I think, isn't it? And I think, um, I, I hope that from the, you know this year that it has made us stronger as as societies and as groups. And I think we've all become to realise what's important to us in life. Suddenly, health, health, nature, and our surroundings. It's taken us back. Those of you that know that, that know Maslow's theory of uh, triangle, that yeah. Maslow's triangle, will know that we all now know that the bits at the bottom, the, the what is it, security, housing, and health, and all the rest, getting up to the top and going to the gym and round the world cruises. I'm afraid is out of the question. Um, I'm hoping to get my holidays at Christmas, but I'm seeing it disappearing. <laughs> As we speak. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody. If anyone's got any uh, questions, Avan, uh, I notice most of you have muted yourselves, so you will obviously need to unmute to ask a question. Um, are there any? Yes. Um, Anne, um, I've been quite upset in the last couple of weeks by the stories of, of uh, families trying to take their elderly relatives out of care homes and there have been the most awful fuss with the police and everything else and I just wondered what the background to that was I mean I'd always assume that it would be quite easy to take a relative out if you weren't happy with it <clears throat> well in, the in theory I think um I I saw I, I saw briefly the one where a lady a lady was arrested in front of a, a 97 year old for taking her out of the care home and I suppose they the case that, that their argument will be that they're taking them out, but then they're taking them back. And so with the risks that entails with, you know, potentially taking COVID back in there, there may be questions about whether the family member was capable of looking, looking after them. Uh, but this is the sort of work that Age UK National are doing and campaigning with, with, with the government on, because it's striking that balance. And if there was a balance, it's about things being proportionate, I think is the words they use. You know, it's about being proportionate, isn't it, about the risk of people um, contracting COVID, taking it into homes, visiting a family member, using all PPEs. 
Now, one of my friends, she went to visit her mother in the care home, very ill, and said, you can come and spend some time with her. A few days later, she got a phone call to say, your mum's got COVID, you better go and get a test. She was clear. Her mum had picked it up in the care home. It wasn't, a daughter hadn't taken it in. Fortunately, she tested negative, which again proved it. But um, And so the risks are more, I think, from staff taking things in than family members who are obviously going to be obsessively careful as well. And now if we, if we get into the stage where we can do 30 minute tests, um, surely to goodness, we should be able to have situations where people can take, take tests and be shown to be negative and then go in PPE'd. So as things are changing, there's an awful lot more pressure being put on care homes. Um, I'm completely with people on this. Um, we have to be careful, we have to be safe, but um, my, my my mother no longer since COVID doesn't recognise my father anymore, and you sort of think, will we ever know? You know whether that would have happened. Mm. Um, it's a really tough one. Um, I th it just built a frustration of anger. If you won't let me come in and see my parent, I'm going to take them out. And I think care homes have got to use far more initiative. There are ways and means of doing it. We're talking about pods in gardens. Some have been doing it all the way along the line. And a lot of it is just down to actually the mentality of the organisations running the homes. I had assumed that the problem was people who wanted to take them out permanently. And that's what the fuss was about. That's what worried me. Not taking them out for a visit, but to take them away altogether. Well, I mean, my feeling would be they're perfectly limited to do that. I mean, not if not if not if the patient is sectioned. That's a problem. There are a couple of homes. Sectioned, there are a couple of homes in Lancaster that specialise in section patients, and therefore it would be very difficult for for relatives who cared deeply for their uh, loved one but couldn't look after them because of their violence or whatever. They wouldn't be allowed to take them out. But the yeah. point is, there are lots and lots of people in care homes who needn't be there. They should be cared for with their family at home, and. The reason they, they're not allowed to take them out is because the care homes want the money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think and I'm with you on that. You know, if, if people, uh, you know, a, a, a section, then that, that's absolutely one thing. If the, if the family are, are wanting to take them out permanently and they can care for them, well, that's for the families to prove. That's not for the care homes to say either way. They're not there to judge the, the family's ability to care um, at all. Um, and people should be at, should be at liberty to do so. And as you say, they're just looking for the eight hundred quids a week, frankly. Eight hundred, a thousand at least. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mine's mine's nine hundred and fifty. Yeah. So, uh, um, you know, and so quite honestly, if you're paying that amount of money, I would expect the care home to be showing level, levels of um, support and initiative, initiative and yeah. investing a little bit of expense into making things secure and, and and as i say pods in gardens or places where people can go and meet up because you know it's not feasible for us to keep going and talking through an open window you know for example to my mother as the weather hits these sort of temperatures um so i'm with you, i'm with you on all of that and yeah i haven't been following it closely enough i'm afraid but certainly age uk national are campaigning like billy o in london their influencing team um, is very very active and people do listen to Age UK and we have um, 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 a, a, an epidemiologist who happens to be our head of research in London she said when I started two years ago nobody knew what an epidemiologist was at Age UK they thought it had to do with skin but by god they're glad they've got me now there's two of them they're called doom and gloom um, but uh, for up-to-date information actually on what's happening um, the Age UK National website is actually pretty good because they've got some very skilled people there with knowledge and, and sort of good ins to the government as well. So it's worth I mean, keeping an eye on, actually. Uh, any other So I don't know if I've answered your question, really. Any other questions? No? Um, in that case, Anne... Um, I'd like to thank you uh, very much. I think you've opened uh, our eyes to the size of the uh, problems that you you face, um, and um, you know, hopefully uh, we can uh, look at 
ways in which we can help our neighbors, friends, and, and relatives um, get, their, get themselves through this situation. That's super. And um, you've, you've, you've got the recording there. Um, please, would people jot down, if you've got a pen in front of you, the following number, mm -hmm. which is our customer services line, which is... Um, I don't know if you can see it behind me up there, but it's 0300 303 1234. And that's our phone line straight through to our customer services team. So all the information, you know, so that if you've concerned about anybody in any way, please do give them a ring and they'll refer them on. And if and if and if it's something that we can't help with, we'll always know a man or woman who can help. You know, we'll we'll always make sure it gets sorted. Can you repeat that telephone number? They took yeah. a little, little while to find the pencil and paper. No, you're all right. O three hundred three o three one two three four. You got it. Yeah, and the, uh, I did want to ask a question, but the the chairman jumped in too quickly. Oh, I do beg your pardon. Um, the, the, one of the, I think last slide, but one said something connector, um, social, something, something, social. Connector. Something, yeah. something connect. What was it? What's, what was it? Can they, you... Yes, I'll explain. Yes, sorry. And, I, and I, I should have explained that. I do apologize. I think sometimes you use words and they get too much into your, to your brain, don't you? You assume social connectors and social prescribers are essentially the same things. Um, Lancaster City Council has a team of, of, um, of connectors and they really have worked um, through, through COVID, telephoning people, checking on the welfare and referring as they need to. The community connectors, they're called there. Um, and we've worked closely with the team. Social prescribers are, are linked to doctors' surgeries. Doctors are finally invested in um, preventative means so that um, they have staff there who, if the doctor's concerned about somebody and it's an issue that isn't a pill or a potion, they will refer them to the social prescribers and they will prescribe them for things that are to do with their health and well-being. So it might well be the way they live. It might be that they're living in poor conditions. It might be that they need activity. Um, it might be that they have dementia and, uh, and the family member is looking for activities for them to do. So it's, it's everything about people's health and well-being that isn't directly medical. And we've been trying to do that work for donkey's years with the doctor surgeries. And fortunately, the investment went into it pretty well last year. And, and it's been so vital during COVID because you know we've been able to keep in touch all around the county um, with those staff members. Yeah, really great teams. Okay, does that answer your question? You're, you're, you're muted. Yes, thank you. Good, thank you. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to Ask. Oh, <laughs> don't want to be accused of jumping in too quickly. Um, so, right. Well, I think it um, remains for me to say thank you, Anne, um, for uh, a fascinating uh, talk. And can I ask us all to show our appreciation in the usual manner? Or even got the sound. Um, <laughs> first time I've been clapped virtually. <laughs> <laughs> There's a first time for everything. Yeah. Uh, please, please do all have a look at, at our website. Um, on, on Monday, if you Google Art of Isol Age UK Lancashire Art of Isolation, the, and if you do it now, you'll have a sneak preview, actually, uh, but it's not live. Um, it's got wonderful, wonderful bit artworks, um, and it's a the actual book. I'm going to plug the book. We're making no money out of it at all, um, but it is just the most wonderful history of a snapshot in in time. And 
I could just see if if it allows me to screen share it, uh, uh, chair. If you if you don't mind, um, I could I, I can possibly just pick. Um, no, it's not. Hang on. Yes, I can. If you um, can you see that? No. 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 No, it's because I forgot to press share screen first. Yeah, you, you need to have them ready on the taskbar yeah. at the bottom. Yeah, it's here. It's it's there. I've just have now. You should be able to see it. <laughs> oh yes. Ah. Yeah. So this is just uh, one front screen that's showing a lot. The lady there, Gra Granny M Marie, she took photographs of her grandchildren. She used to see them virtually every day. And she said, nobody's allowed to leave Granny's house without a hug. And of course she couldn't. So she's taken a series of photos. This was a gentleman that had never painted in his life with his trees. And his son actually drew the outlines and his dad filled them in. Um, and uh, some of the beach huts going, um, that they've drawn. Um, We've got uh, um, uh, this gentleman here uh, sent the most Wait. amazing paintings through, um, and he the one the one with the lady the lady with the headscarf on that's a mosaic, and he won't show his work to anybody because he doesn't think it's any good. And this is like the first time he'll have been seen publicly. Um, so we've got we've got teddy bears um, that somebody made. We've got a um, um, gentleman here took a photograph of all some of his photography that he'd done when he couldn't go anywhere else. Um, oh, I can't remember the story with, with, with that, that um, sculpture there. Um, um, that's the paint, paintings. Um, oh, there's uh, unbelievable, unbelievable um, works. Um, there's Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse and everyone wants to be a cat. That's our human resources manager. She moved house. She was due to move house the week of lockdown and she was stuck. And then she was eventually allowed to move. So she, she's quite artistic, but she's also suffers an awful lot of pain all the time. And so she, she decorated her workroom with all sorts of, 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 of um, cartoon characters to, to just make her feel happy. There's a picture there of a lockdown loo rolls, uh, somebody trying to fence black market loo rolls. So, and this the gentleman here, the side of his house, he'd, he'd, he'd whitewashed it before lockdown. And uh, people say, oh, you should paint a mural on that. So, so in lockdown every week, he actually came up with a, he did it all digitally, but he sort of did a projection of what it would look like on the side of his house. So we're hoping that, you know, Eventually, he'll choose one of them, actually put it on the side. And then we've got the lockdown haircut. So there's Minnie and Mickey again. So it's just scrolling through uh, pictures of family, uh, the, the young man on the, the ashram, photographs through, through the window again. Um, so you, you can see it's many and varied, and that's just one page of it. Then there's the poetry, the writings. It's really worth having a look at. And as I say, the book, in the book, we've taken two pieces of work from each from each artist uh, and put them on the one side of the double page spread, and on the other side, we've put the story of what brought them. So what brought uh, Cheryl to do her Minnie Mouse and a Mickey Mouse. What brought people to grow the cabbages in 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 buckets? Um, you know why people started zooming. Um, so it's a really interesting historical piece of work, actually. And um, um, I'm very proud of, of of the production of it. I've been managing the production, but I haven't been doing the work. I've had a, a very talented lady who lives in Bolton Sands. Um, Jackie Harris, who's a storyteller, she's been collating it and putting it all together. But it's been a huge learning curve. But I think it's it's actually very special, the book, because it's just a real snapshot in in time. And uh, anyway, I'm flogging those for $9.99. Right. If anybody is interested, uh, David's got all my details. Yeah, um, can I ask, uh, I seem to recall you telling me that you've self-published this as well. We were, we were, we started off with the intention of self-publishing, which we were talking about about vision, weren't we? About the about the book that you found, um, and 
we we in the end we didn't but that was because a lot of the self-publishing companies were having problems getting hold of enough paper so in the end we had to go to a publisher in manchester a very well uh, very you know long-standing company and pay actually we've had you know the first 200 printed off as i say they should land on my door mat tomorrow um we are hoping down the line that if we if we want more copies down the line that we will go the self publishing route as as the world settles down a bit more and for the veterans project when we produce the book from that i hope we'll do it self publishing because then people just order it off the internet as you would any book off amazon um, and we then don't have to worry about paying paying you know up front for the publications um, we don't have to send anything out. If people want it, they click through the website, they pay for it online and the book's delivered and they're printed to order. And for us, that would be a far simpler and more economical um, use of time and money. But we just couldn't risk it. For, for the, we had to publish this book for the end of October because the funding that we received stipulated it had to be spent by the end of October and the project completed. Um, and the, the, the next one for the veterans submissions will be for the end of March. So if anybody knows anybody who's a veteran, um, you served in the armed forces or whatever, who, who has created anything, uh, is at, you know, write, doing writing, poetry. We've had lovely submissions from a gentleman in Blackpool who never painted in his life before. And people are now commissioning him to do portraits. I mean, he's just amazing. So please do spread the word if people have any links with British Legion or any local people. Um, um, you know, please, please do let us know. It's like everything, it's getting the word out there, getting to reach people. Very much so. Right, thank you, Anne. Um, right. Um, well, I think that concludes uh, the evening. Um, our next... Uh, gathering uh, as I said at the beginning is on the 9th was it of uh, December um, when we'll have a, a Christmas ghost story um, so uh, I uh, which I hope we'll enjoy uh, well I'll be enjoying it because I'll be giving it but um, uh, <laughs> So uh, all I can say is thank you uh, for coming. Uh, thank you again, Anne, and uh, safe journey home. <laughs> I've just put actually in the chat, uh, we haven't mentioned chat today, I have just put my personal, my, my direct email and work telephone number in the chat bar as well, if anybody wants to take that. Right. Well, David, thank you we'll very, very much that. indeed for having me. My pleasure. Thank you very much. I'll say night-night yeah. as well. The next talk will be on gun running. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Not nearly as exciting as it sounds, but good, good times. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks bye -bye. Much, Al. Bye. 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 Bye.